I, I watched the the um, the Patagonia film, The Complete Fisherman. And that ties in with where I've been going a little bit. That it, it, it's a film about an Italian guy who fishes in the mountains there, um, with an old sort of wooden line with a horse hair, uh, wooden rod, sorry, and a horse hair line, and just fishes really simply. It's almost a former Tenkara, really. That was Pete Tigus telling us about a great movie and how the world will be different after COVID nineteen. We got a lot going on today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Pete Titus, the editor of Fly Culture Magazine, is on the show today to shed some light on your nipping, chalk streams, and what he takes away from steelhead fishing. Find out which tactic he thinks is the most deadly for fish, how and why he created an ad-free magazine and the other big players in the UK market. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. The Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has another jam-packed summer edition that's out right now. Stay tuned at the midway point of this episode for my first poetry read from a special author in the summer edition. And you can head over to ftjangler.com right now to support the great stuff Craig and the crew has going over there and grab some great reads for your next fly fishing trip. Gotfishing.com is your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. You'll never pay a dime extra for the trip you book and in many cases less than advertised. Find out where Got Fishing could take you by heading over to gotfishing.com today. That's G-O-T fishing.com or reach them by phone at 208-630-3373. So without further ado, here is Pete Deitches from Fly Culture Magazine. How's it going, Pete? It's going, th- it's going really well, thanks, Dave. And thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan and listener of the podcast myself, and it's great to um, actually speak to you too. Yeah, that that is amazing. You know, that that's one of the cool things about this space I love. I mean, I'm a podcast addict, so when I have a chance to talk to another pod, I mean, I guess when you let's start off there. You know, do you consider yourself? I mean, I, I just I was going to call you a podcaster, but you probably don't consider yourself a podcaster. What, what do you think you do best in the fly fishing space? <laughs> I would love to say I'm a podcaster, but appearing on yours shows what a professional outfit's actually like. But it's, I, I guess, a, a bit of everything. You know, I've, I really enjoy. Um, doing the podcast and I love talking to people about fishing but it really is more of a vehicle for the the bigger picture of what we're trying to do with the magazine and I thought it was a, a way of giving people free content and a way of letting them know that we exist out in the in the fishing world really yeah, yeah that's it that's it no I, we're going to jump into I definitely want to get into the, the magazine because that's a big thing you have going but uh, maybe you can just start us off first and talk about how you first got into fly fishing and then how you brought it up into having a, a magazine Sure. I'd, I'd been a, a typically, I'm sort of 54 years of age now and tip, did the typical route of fishing, gear fishing, I guess you'd call it mm-hmm. for carp and pieces like that. And then latterly came to, um, in my early twenties, I played a lot of sport, but I, I found fly fishing and that was it really. And, and the, the scene that we have in the UK is, I think, slightly different. The, the more traditional route of fly fishing in the UK was that you would learn to fish on ponds and catch stocked fish. And then you may eventually find yourself on rivers. And I sort of was addicted immediately to fishing ponds. And then I discovered moving water. And that was just life changing for me. I sort of lived outside London. So we didn't really have a lot of streams there. And I, at the time, I was working in a job that I wasn't enjoying a great deal. And I got a book that came through. The, the John Girac books were starting to come out, and they were sort of really life-shaping for me. And we had a book come out over here called The Pursuit of Wild Trout, and it had a picture of um, a guy fishing a, a moorland stream in the back country, I guess you would call it. And that was it. And we sold our house and moved down to the southwest of the UK, um, to Devon, where there are a hell of a lot of trout streams. Mm. Um, and that was it. And then I got in and met somebody who had one of the first sort of guiding businesses in the UK, a full-time guide, and worked for him for a couple of years. 
And then um, I got sort of my basic qualifications for coaching and teaching fly casting and fishing, took the advanced ones and really, really enjoyed. I loved, for me, fly fishing. The reason I got into the tuition, I think, was that I just wanted people to love fly fishing like I did and a chance to pass on my love for it. Um, was a great way to go. So I was a full-time um, fishing guide, one of the few again for 16 years. I set up my own company and I've just packed up this year um, and to concentrate on the magazine really and the podcasts and everything else. But it's just been a wonderful environment to work in, slightly different to the UK that we don't have drift boats. The streams are a little bit smaller. We um, wade um, but they're cracking little streams we have down in this part of the world and wonderful little wild brown trout. There you go. And, and so and so the magazine, basically, you were, I mean, it sounds like you like a lot of us, right? You just had this love and you wanted to take it to the next level. Hey, talk about the magazine a little bit. How, how did, uh, you know, how did you actually pull the trigger on that and get that going? And is it just you doing the magazine or, there, you know, can you talk about the whole thing and then what and describe the magazine to somebody who hasn't, who hasn't read it? Sure, absolutely. Well, the way it came about was it started actually in Montana and I was fishing Rock Creek outside of Missoula. I have a real affinity with fishing the American Midwest and have loved it. And subsequently, that's delved into steelhead as well. Um, but I was fishing Rock Creek and I'd caught a nice trout and I was sitting in a rock and my buddy I was fishing with walked down and said, how are you doing? And I said, yeah, this is pretty good. <laughs> and I said, wouldn't it be great to be able to share these moments with people? And so I started, when I got back, within about three months, I'd launched an online um, e-zine, I guess they were called at the time, called Eat, Sleep, Fish. And it was free. It was not for profit. We had people from all over the, the world, really, um, writing for us. And that was great fun to do. And I learned my trade there as well. So that was interesting dealing with people, editing, everything else. I did six years of that mm. and we put out 70 odd um, issues of that. It's still out in the ether somewhere as well. So you can still find it. And we were, it was really cool that we were able to break new writers, photographers, plus have well-known um, anglers in there as well. And it, it, it went really, really well. But the next thing for me, it was it was interesting to see how the, the magazine space was going and, you know, it, with declining numbers, uh, advertising revenues, everything else, it looked as though it was a difficult marketplace. But I'd always planned that I wanted to try and bring a best of hard copy of the online magazine that we had. And it sort of grew from there and, and from that fly culture grew and it came to life relatively quickly. And the idea behind it was that in the UK, still fly fishing, um, my my sort of where I see fishing really and how I think it's cool is more in places like the US, Canada and Scandinavia particularly. And in the UK, it's still seen as a little bit staid. It's something you may progress to. The perception of fly fishing to me um, was still a little bit not where I, I felt it could be better represented. So what we did with fly culture, a lot of I say a lot of the magazines, we've only really got uh, three, I think. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it would be about how to alongside some stories. But, you know, with the, the Internet and everything else, the need to teach people how to do things it didn't make sense so what we wanted to really do was focus on the why of fishing yeah. and why we wanted to do it and we we took a unique um view with it in that given that the magazine marketplace was difficult trying to run a magazine with av advertising revenue would be problematic so what i decided was to go instead of try and get advertising revenue to have a slightly higher cover price but to say we will give you a hundred percent content and that enabled us as well to be independent so we can say and do whatever we want we can take the magazine where we want as well so we have sort of features from the uk um, Europe and the US as well. So, you know, we have, I think we've got some Golden Dorado in the, the next one that's coming up, you know, um, South American sea trout yep. and stuff like that. So it's a real mixture of stuff. And I think I didn't want to be 
concentrated on just the UK because I think you can run out of stuff. So um, because we do it quarterly, what I wanted was the readers not to know what they're going to get each time. So it's always a little bit different. The themes are different. Um, but the, having good writing and, and cool photography was really important to me as well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And yeah, since it is such a worldwide fly fishing, you know, has become this you know, destinations and, you know, it makes sense that you can cover, I kind of struggled that a little bit, you know, with that a little bit at the start as well, you know, because the, the, the old saying, well, I don't know if it's old, but the, uh, the riches are in the niches, you know, to, to niche down when you're starting your thing, it, it helps you. But, um, and I kind of start out, we start out the steelhead fishing, right. A little bit and then expanded out. And I just felt like I wanted to cover the world, right. It just felt better yeah. to me, even though I still am more Northwest focused. I mean, now we're talking to you, right. And you're on the other side of the, of the pond. So, <laughs> I mean, do you feel like you made uh, on the magazine is kind of on the same track that you originally, the idea you originally uh, came up with? Uh, definitely. And it's been, I've been lucky and you asked who was involved with it as well. And my friend Brett, um, works funnily enough in advertising. And oh, yeah. when I said, we're not going to have adverts. He said, what? He couldn't <laughs> believe it. you know. And I'm pleased it's done that. And it's given us a little bit of a unique selling point and made us a little bit different in our marketplace. And, and fishing in the UK is, you know, it's a pretty small part of the world, really. And fly fishing is even smaller. Um, so to give people and I wanted to represent people my sort of age and below and make it a little bit more the American, a sort of American look in, in the sense of not tweeds and check shirts, but baseball caps, T-shirts and jeans. And that's where we're coming from. And we felt that there would be a marketplace for that that's been pleasing. And we've tried not to grow it too aggressively. We're just sort of we like the word of mouth sort of feel of it. And that's what I did with the online magazine as well. And we got it to one stage. I think it was around 20,000 unique readers per month on the online wow. magazine. And I could have easily done something with that and I probably could have monetized it. But I kind of like the idea of going into a marketplace that that was str not struggling, but wasn't as fresh as it was. Yeah, I looked at the independent market for magazines and that's really thriving. I don't know if it's the same in that part of the world, but, but people are doing runs of magazines for all sorts of topics and seems yeah. to be doing well. Yeah, no, I think the that's a cool thing. The print media the magazines and the books i think they're still doing pretty solid in fact we have fly, uh, the fly fishing tying journal is a sponsor of this podcast so we're you know uh, currently you know have a cool local magazine we i feel the same way i kind of like the local thing and uh, we've got a cool company we're working with so that works out well so i'm going to go back to that so you said the eat sleep fish so that was your first you said six years of your basically an online magazine blog Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So it was like an e-zine and we'd have probably 12 to 15 articles in it. And we would have people from everywhere. And it was great to be able to, like I said, break some new writers and a couple of people subsequently went on to um, write some books and we ne were name checked in those. And I wrote the, the a, a little review on the back of a cover of a book a guy wrote and things like that were really pleasing to do. And again, it's another thing of what it means to me and being so deeply in, immersed in fishing. You know, I worry sometimes that I'm too one dimensional, that it means so much to me. But um, it, it really is. And I know I'm not alone. I know your listeners will be the same as well, that to have something that means so much to you is it, I feel really lucky to have that. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's why I'm, I'm sticking with this and kind of doubling down is that I think that the people involved are, you know, that's the amazing thing about conservation and just all the cool people that are connected to it. Um, I want to jump into a little bit here uh, on, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about it, but at the start, uh, chalk streams. Can you describe maybe what a chalk stream is for somebody who hasn't uh, seen one before? Yeah, absolutely. So they're different. Now, our, our streams uh, where I fish here are kind of similar to yours. They're spate or freestone rivers. We don't have dams and stuff there, so we don't have tailwaters as such. Chalk streams are different, though. And what happens is that water falls, and when rain falls on the chalk hills, it, it flows down and percolates into the spring. And then that spring gets filled out, and it continually percolates that water back out into the river system and um, it's not acidic at all so it promotes great weed growth the bugs enjoy it and as a result the fish 
um, enjoy that too as well. So you've got those famous rivers mostly around the southeast, just outside London in Hampshire, Wiltshire, Dorset. They do go further north as well uh, into Yorkshire. There's one up there. I, I drove a long way just to fish it for one day. Um, which was pretty cool. But I think the nearest description I would probably give um, is Spring Creek. Mm -hmm. So I fished some of the Spring Creeks in Montana. So I would say it's kind of like that. There's so much tradition there. Um, some of it, you know, you can, some of the beats that you fish there, um, that you can only fish a, a dry fly upstream to the fish. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the tradition is wonderful to observe and to see them. They're beautifully keepered. Um, and the, the the thing to bear in mind as well, without we don't have public water, so you can't just buy a license and turn up and fish. So you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, so some of those, and we got the green drakes just starting to they'll be coming off before too long. The danicas, as we call them, the, or, the, or the mayfly, and they'll be coming off soon. And that can be really expensive to fish at that time of year. But to be able to see the fish, see how they behave is really cool. Whereas on the freestone and, and spate rivers that we have here, very often, if you're not seeing fish rising, you might be fishing a dry dropper and fishing to where you think fish might be, but it's really cool to fish them and see the fish, see the reaction and, and the tradition of it as well. You know, it's a pretty amazing place. We don't have many fishing towns really in the UK, but there's one in Hampshire called Stockbridge, which may fly time is pretty cool. You know, you'll see stacks of flies laid out and guides coming in with um, picking up mayfly patterns and everything else. So it is really, really super cool. Um, and it's lovely. You know, I, I know a lot of people from the US um, and around the world have read and heard about the the test, the Itchin, um, these sorts of rivers, and they really are beautiful and great fun to fish as well. That's cool. So basically, with the with the chalk stream, you you made the note kind of like a spring creek. So it's compared to you know, and talk about the streams more your home water you fish up, you know, where you're at now, and the differences there. Yeah, as as would be probably our streams would probably be more akin to yours, fish per mile. And, you know, I've I've not fished the green in Utah, but I fished the Yellowstone a number of times. And yeah. I think that's quite a healthy number. It's at about 6,000 per mile. We don't have those numbers. The rivers are far more acidic. Um, so we don't get as many um, fish per mile. I, I, nobody's really been able to tell me how many it actually is, but we don't get huge numbers. And with the, the rivers being so acidic, and this is this goes for a lot, a fair few of the rivers around the UK as well. Um, that we'll get a run of sea trout. So our equivalent of steelhead in the sense that some of those fish will run out to sea, feed, and then come back into the river to spawn again as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. And and so what what is the, you know, when you think about your fishing, what is the thing that really gets you excited? You know, if you have one, t one place to go fishing-wise, what, what, what are you thinking about? Oh, it's my home river. It's not a, you know, a big name river or anything. It's called the Tor, the T-A-W, Tor. Mm -hmm. And it has everything I want. So I can fish it up in the high country or as high as we get, which is obviously nothing comparable to you guys. But I can go fish up there and catch five or six inch little brown trout. Um, I can go a little bit further down, catch some, you know, a standard fish are really 10 to 13 inches. I was yeah. lucky. I did some dirty stuff and pulled a streamer last year and caught something pushing four and a quarter, which for our neck of the four and a quarter pounds, sorry, um, for our neck of the woods is a huge, huge trout. Um, but most of them, you know, a good fish would be 16 inches, um, 16, 18 in inches would be a really, really special fish. Um, we get a run of salmon again, you know, as everyone with sea run fish is having issues with, we don't get big numbers of, of salmon, run the river um, and last year to give you a flavor we had 83 caught on our river in total yeah. that was it 83 salmon so that was it we had a few more sea trout at 250 some of that's lack of angling pressure um, but that's indicative of good to give you a flavor of what that's like though a good year is about 300 oh, okay so not big numbers so we put the hours in and it is for that moment for the line to go tight. And of course, we have the, and you know, it is so much more important having this lockdown and, and making sure 
people aren't mixing but it was just getting right for spring salmon we sort of we only fish from march till september and that's it so it is a a super long season but of course we having these sort of really dry summers doesn't help the run as well so part of that probably makes the numbers look worse than they actually are but that's a factor of it and, and runs aren't good right now that's gotcha Okay, cool. So, uh, so yeah, and I guess before we jump back into this, Pete, um, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. So, what what would you, uh, you know, what, if we, you know, had another 20 minutes to dig into something, did you have anything uh, stream wise or tactics, or are you good talking about dry flies a little bit? About that, we can talk about dry fly fishing. We can talk about urinimphing. We can talk about salmon fishing and how um, salmon to me, how I've been fishing for salmon slightly differently now in the sense that having steelhead fish you know i'm fishing t right. t14s t- and intruders oh nice um, when the water's right now i'm just going back to old school patterns and lady carolines and acroids and things like that um and also how fishing's changing i think in the sense of you know um patagonia's film the complete fisherman the impact that may have on people when they're able to go out and fish again Right, right. Yeah, the complete fisherman. I hadn't even heard of that. Uh, I guess I, I don't think I've heard of that yet. Is that, that is that a brand new movie that's coming out? Yeah, it's a Pasconi one. It's out, and it's about a guy who's fished. He must be in his eighties, something like that now, and he has fished with a, a like a tenkara type wooden rod with a horsehair line. And Yvonne shonard has gone out there and fished with him and and learned a little bit about it. And I. I wonder, you know, it might be worth talking a little bit about how we're going to come out of fishing if fishing will look a little bit different. And that's where urinimphing ties in for me, Dave, a little bit in the sense that, you know, it's a wonderful technique, but do we need to leave some of the fish alone as well? Do we need to catch every fish in the river as well? You know, I've been a guide for 16 years, so I've seen some some interesting stuff as well. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, yeah. I was going to check in on some of that stuff. So. Yeah, let, let's dig into the Euro a little bit. I just had somebody in the group uh, who kind of, uh, I think, maybe called me out a little bit, but he said something like, uh, I, I was asking about topics. He said, you know, do a, do another Euro nip episode, but make sure it's not basic. You know, like, I want, I want some advanced. So could you give us some advanced uh, tips and tricks on Euro nipping? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. So, yeah, I mean, we've covered, I've had a few really great guests on, and we've talked about Euro nipping and I still haven't, I still haven't been out there and really, you know, broken it out. I've had a, a good friend of mine, uh, Shannon, he's been, he's been tested the waters and, uh, been really loving it, but I don't know. Where do you want to start? If you, if somebody asked you, like, tell me some advanced tactics for Euro, where, where do you start on that? Well, um, I think one of the things as well is that with Euro nymphing and it can be, it covers so many different things as well. I, I would think one of the things that's worth working with a little bit is pitching your flies a little bit further and what i mean by that is if you look at your nymphing that's the term as a whole but within that we've had polish czech french nymphing and the french nymphing part of it's kind of interesting because they're fishing high uh, mountain rivers to sighted fish in shallow water so what those guys have done instead of you know i think a lot of people and it's always open for interpretation as well that is it another kind of form of high sticking in a different way? Yeah. Um, and check nymphing was was certainly that way to to almost fish by your feet with super heavy bugs and to get down to them. But I think there's other methods that you, you can actually employ. And, and if you're able to spot fish and sight fish as well, that mastering a longer uh, distance cast as well, I think is worth playing with. A little bit more as well and that will give you an advantage and of course that will get your flies down a little bit deeper as well so i think that's a, a kind of interesting one mm-hmm. the other one as well is you know playing with flies and sizes of flies as well um and i'm seeing sort of from much smarter year and infers than i a trend towards smaller but heavier bugs and where people you know a lot of it and i i sort of I use personally uranymphing as a skill that I can use, but I try not to use it all the time. And we fish for grayling 
in the winter and that's the most i will probably fish that method mm. because by virtue of them being more so of a bottom feeder although yeah. we do catch them on dries as well that to me is a is a great way to um actually catch fish but where we've had the dry summers that i've talked about that what we're seeing is fish bunched up in um the the, the heads of pools the fast runs of pools and we could easily pull a load of fish out of that run, but I'm sort of, I guess part of it's as I get older as well, that, you know, I want to catch what I feel is a fair share and then move on. Yeah. Um, so I think it's probably one of the most devastating tactics that we've actually had. And I think one of the key things as well um, to play with that a little bit more is the manipulation of the flies as well. Um, and that's what I kind of like to do. So I like to get the flies down along the bottom. Then I might just... Uh, an inch or two movement up and down with the rod tip mm -hmm. and just manipulate those flies in the water. And that can be a really useful way of catching fish. And what I like to do as well, I know people say to set at the end of the drift, but I actually like to try and induce the fish more slowly. So get them, a, give them a chance to really come up and, and have a go at the, the fly then as well. So my lift up will be a little bit slower as well rather than the set because I think there's a chance I might bring a fish into play that way as well. Um, I think there's probably ways of, and people are doing it as well, of fishing a smaller streamer that way as well mm -hmm. and manipulating, be it a marabou tail, um, to, to bring fish into play that way as well. So I think that's a really um, interesting way to do it mentioned a few flies there what are a few flies that you might you, you know you talked about smaller ones can you talk a little bit about what smaller is and then what what are some patterns you might use absolutely you know there's th we've had patterns that are sort of uh, varnished or treated with uv called perdigons oh yeah um they're getting some popularity but it was really interesting over this winter i switched back to a pheasant that uh, pheasant tail nymph mm -hmm. and then what i did with that was give that a different thorax so I'd play with the thorax. I would play with the color of that thorax. So it might be orange, it might be pink, it might be red, it might be black, because black's a great way to replicate the wing case of a um, bug as, just before it's due to hatch as well. So that's a good one. And then I might change the ribbing on there. So I might have copper, I might have silver, I might have red, and then I might put a hackle on there. It might be a CDC hackle. And I just fish those patterns over the winter and it worked really, really well for me. So there are loads and loads of um, patterns that are coming out all the time. The cynic in me thinks perhaps they may be driven a little bit by, by new products coming to the market, but sometimes varying what you're actually familiar with can give you a, a different fly box as well. So within that, then I can change fly size. So I may put, you know, I have a wider gape jig hook and a heavier bead on it as well so that it will be smaller and grayling tend to like, you know, they'll, 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 they'll eat stuff. But, but I, I kind of like that idea of fishing those smaller, more, more subtle patterns a lot of the time. And um, that's worked really well for me. Um, but I would, I would, play with mastering the distance and controlling that distance and seeing how that goes but manipulation for me is often underutilized yeah. and will bring fish into play um, and I think that's a, a really cool one and I fish the water as everyone says you know break the water down but I'll fish it pretty quickly I'm searching the whole time I won't sit in one spot I'll keep moving because we don't have big numbers of fish to play with as well so i would just keep moving cover water and search for fish and that's what i'm continually doing and as people have said like i say you know gr gridding up the river yeah. and break into sections and working it through there but getting the right rod and line um combination can can make life a lot easier as well so uh so yeah i wanted to wanted to touch back uh on the magazine uh, you know again this is you know, you're guiding, you're doing a lot of stuff there, but, um, you know, on the magazine, how much, how much time are you putting into this thing? And then, you know, what are some of the, the articles and things that you've seen, uh, you know, get some good traction on? Yeah, it's, it is a fair bit of work. Um, I'm really pleased that it's quarterly because I don't know how people would cope doing something monthly. That must be a Herculean task. And, um, magazines that are doing that have my utmost respect, but I try and be and it's unlike me, but I try and be organized. 
So I kind of know where I'm going to be with articles. I'm continually talking to contributors as well to say, hey, how about this? Or they might pitch me an idea. And then we elaborate on that a little bit more. And then we work with, right, how does the rhythm of it feel? Because that's really important to me as well. So it's not just keyed up in there and ready to go. I'm thinking about the rhythm, how it will read. Okay, we've got a long piece. Do we need something shorter? Um, what do we feel in these sorts of bits and pieces? And, and work along those sorts of lines as well. So I had to teach myself how to use um, Adobe InDesign. Mm -hmm. And then I'm really fortunate that um, we have a designer who's a passionate fly angler as well called John. And what I will do is, because we have 100 pages mm -hmm. Um, like I say, of content every quarter. And so my job is really to uh, to work with that and then fit that to the 100 pages. But we're editing those pieces. And, and the way that I, I think about this is when somebody sends me something, I'll sit there and read it and think, yeah, I like that. And then if I don't, I may not. But if I don't, but there's something there, we try and work with a contributor as well. But I want to try and be, I don't want the article to be what the editor wants it to be. I want it to be as close as to what the contributor wanted it to be. So that it's not have the hell edited out of it, but yeah. at least if we can give people a, a bit of advice and help them along the way. That would be cool. And then we sit there and edit it. My wife is just amazing at this sort of stuff that she sort of sat there and um, she's a, a, a fantastic at reading through and double checking after I have. Then it goes off to the designer. Then it'll go to the printer. And we're really, I'm really proud that I've tried to learn the whole process. So when the magazine comes, we hand pack everyone as well. And very often, if there's one latterly, I'll write a handwritten message saying thank you for supporting us. And we package each one. It's kind of like Christmas in oh, some wow. respect. When you see the finished product in your hand, the smell of it, because we didn't yep. scrimp any corners on quality of paper. Um, so it's thick paper, you know, it's thick paper. And it's kind of like Christmas packaging them all up and then they go out to the distributor to to be sent out again. So we've been hands on with the whole process. The magazine's starting to to grow now. But we, when you say about articles, yeah. we've just had a real mixture of stuff from you know, people fishing and getting their asses kicked, sea trout fishing, yep. um, you know, and, and what we wanted to be is honest about that sort of stuff because, you know, sometimes we do get a, a kicking from the fish as well. So that's really important. And we wanted to be honest and open and transparent about everything. So I run the Instagram, the Facebook, and I interact with people on there. And we're trying to say our whole mantra with this is that we're just like you. We're just like you love it like you do. So that's the, the really important thing to us. But we've had, you know, just about we had a piece of Mongolian time and with from Peter Morse, who I know has been one of your guests. Oh, yeah. Wonderful photographer, wonderful writer. He's in the current edition there. Uh, we've had people like Jason Borger writing for us. Um, writers, Ryan Sparks, who I believe is a well-known writer in your neck of the woods in the fishing community as well. So we've been incredibly lucky to have him. Um, and Jess Hadel Richardson, again, a, a lady who is a fishing photographer, shot our re recent front cover. So, you know, it's been really cool and um, to have those sort of people involved with it as well. So it's a real mixture of stuff. We have poetry in there. Um, anything pretty much goes as long as we feel that our readers will enjoy it. That's the really key thing. And now a quick word from our sponsor. I forget that in the center are rivers and fish unspoken for. That there are valleys, the strata of which we lower into perhaps in the hollow between breaths. In the tiny pause between the rise of summer and its departure, I nearly forget the long sieve of winter, the absence, the fractional glimpses of light. Dear one, I will go without speaking. A blaze, keep me until I disappear. That was a poem by Molly Dam in the summer edition of the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal. On top of uh, some great poetry, as you as you hear here, uh, FTJ is jam-packed with another round of great articles in diverse departments. Joseph Rosano uh, is back again, provides another classic steelhead uh, lesson for everyone. We hear from Garrett Lesko in a stacking deer hair frenzy. Find out about striped bass from Angelo Peloso. And hear uh, from Dave McNeese on singing the blues and material dying. 
Lots of additional articles in the summer edition, including an editor's interview with yours truly about how I became a fly fishing podcaster. Craig uh, did a really good job with this one, so I'm, I'm pretty uh, proud uh, to be in in this edition. I believe I have found the perfect sponsor for the show. I would be uh, it would be really great if you can uh, support FTJ by heading over to FTJ Angler dot com and subscribing so you don't miss any of the tips tricks and stories in the next issue that's ftjangler.com to get started today and uh, tell them uh, tell craig and the crew out there you heard about um, the magazine from the podcast and i'll find a way to uh, put something extra special together for you gotfishing.com a boutique booking agency for fishing adventures around the world Got Fishing is unique in working with a small hand-selected group of outfitters from around the world that are known for providing an experience that is second to none. Got Fishing can be your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. Their sole purpose is to help you plan the most authentic fishing venture while making sure it fits within your budget. The beauty is that everything they do is 100% free. You will never pay a dime extra for your trip, and in many cases, less than advertised. I can attest personally to the service that Got Fishing provides as they have been working with me closely to set my first trip to the Yucatan for saltwater. They have taken care of all the important details and allowed me to avoid worrying about any of the complications. I know Brian and the crew have you covered at Got Fishing. Whether you need a fishing consultant, travel consultant, gear pro, or the like, they have you covered. With top of the line outfitters they represent around the world, they are confident they have just the right trip for you. You can give them a call at 208-630-3373 or head over to gotfishing.com to get started today. Let Got Fishing help you plan the fishing trip you've been dreaming about. That's gotfishing.com. Okay, back to the show. You know, like I mentioned at the at the start of the fly fishing and tying journal is a little more tactical. It's It's been more a little bit how-tos and stuff. And, and some people, uh, you know, you know, maybe talk like there's, there's enough of that out there. And then you got the fly, um, um, the fly fish journal, right. The Drake and stuff like that, which is more, um, a little bit more stories and, and life. I mean, where would you put your magazine if you had to compare it to, to one of those other, I would, I would love to be able to compare it to any of those wonderful publications. Cause I like them all. Yeah. Um, I buy them all, including wet, uh, one, there's a steelhead one as well that I also subscribe oh, yeah, yeah. to. Yep. Um, and we are fly. Left yeah, that's it. Swing the fly. I have that as well. Um, and I would say we are, and I, I would say we're more to less, there's no how to's in there. Yeah. So it is stories about, yeah. um, and, and, you know, be it the company you have on the river, a good cup of coffee with friends, kicking back with them. Um, and that sort of what we're trying to encapsulate is not, it is not about the fish it's about the fishing and that's the important thing for us i think yeah that's cool well I, you know as, as we talk here i i you know the the podcasting thing obviously is my you know my artistic i mean what we're doing here is what i really love probably similar to you you know and i think it's interesting because uh, you have a podcast as well right so you have this thing going and it's more of a side side thing right it's not your main focus but Talk about how, how that podcast uh, got started and why you wanted to start a podcast and how all that's going. Yeah, we had the I started the Fly Culture podcast. Oh, we've done about 26 episodes now. I've been trying to put them out weekly because I had so many stacked up that I'd I'd recorded. And I thought it was a kind of cool thing to give people something to listen to when they're not able to go fishing. Um, but it was, you know, listening to um, podcasts like this one was a, a great inspiration and what I wanted to try and do because not everyone's going to buy fly culture right yeah. um, with the best will in the world but what I wanted to do was give them something anyway and it was the same with the online magazine East Sea Fish I wanted to give fly fish something that means so much to me something back so it's kind of cool having worked in the industry for 16 years I've been lucky enough to know a lot of people who would sit down and chat with me mm -hmm. and we're doing pretty similar to what you're doing it just talking about life about yeah. fishing what it means to you and it was a way of sort of reaching people in a different way because the social media marketplace is is pretty crowded is pretty busy um and we can do that and i you know i try and put out instagram posts every day every other day and put those things but i wanted to 
to let people know a little bit about me, a little bit about the people that I'm talking to and a little bit. We don't really mention the magazine in any great way at all. It's just sitting down and uh, like we're doing now, Dave, really, yeah. and, and talking about something that means so much to us. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's awesome. And I, I will plug. I like to plug my new uh, my new podcast where I can. I've got the uh, the Outdoors Online Marketing podcast is, is focused on helping Really, I'm focused on helping fly fishing brands grow, uh, you know, their influence online. So that that's something you you noted Instagram there. I actually just had an Instagram guest who talked about some huge tips that that really have helped helped our Instagram channel as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll send you a link to that and give you a heads up there. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I think that's one of the things with the podcasting. I think I was just talking to um, Michael O'Neill on that other show, and he was mentioning we were talking about that the difference between tactics. Because it's the same thing with the podcast, right? You can have a podcast that's all about tips and tricks, which this one is a lot. But you could also have a podcast that's just about stories. And 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 he was saying the same thing that you know he thinks the stories are the most important thing. And I and I I agree, right? I think they are important. So how do you, you know, how, how do you think you would balance that on a podcast? Say say you had some tips and tricks and some stories. How how would you balance to try to get both of those out there? I'm like I said, I'm not as organized and as professional as you, Dave. But yeah. <laughs> it sort of it sort of takes off in all sorts of directions. So I will have a guest and then what I'll do with that guest, we'll take, we'll have a rough idea of what we're going to talk about, but it can suddenly go off and then uh, they may talk about something and I may suddenly, you know, we'll go down that rabbit hole for a bit and then come back out and I somehow manage to pull it back again and do it that sort of way. Well, I have done some and it was a really interesting one with a, a friend of mine who I used to work for initially, Nick actually, and we sat down and we did a podcast and I said, I want you to bring four pieces of tackle that have meant a lot to you this year that you've been using have been really useful i'm going to do the same and we're not going to tell each other what they are that's cool and then we're going to just and that worked really really well it was a really interesting way of doing it and so it wasn't sort of you know biased in any way we just said look we're not being given these things this is just what we're using and as people who are out on the river a hell of a lot yeah it's a really cool thing to do and that was really interesting to see how that one went down. What was the most, what, can you talk about somebody's uh, four tackle items? Uh, I had, I had a, it was the Sage light line, trout light line rod, which has been, uh, you know, that was a tricky one coming back to a rod that they'd released 20 odd years ago. And that was quite a ballsy move. And that was uh, really, really interesting to see them bring that one out. And it seems to be working really well. We had a pair of waders from a company called Vision. I don't mm -hmm. know if you have in yeah. the US, yeah. um, which um, are really hard wearing and incredibly good. Uh, we had, I use a pack from Patagonia mm -hmm. that is really, I've been blown away by actually, because a lot of these ones, the problems you have if you're like me and got short legs and way deep, your fly boxes get drenched. Yep. And so the way they've set that up, I think, is absolutely fantastic. Funnily enough, my friend mentioned a Patagonia thing that you stick on the front of your waders and you can put a fly box and some other bits and pieces in. There was rain jackets. There was another rod, a McKenzie rod um, that was really cool. So it was a nice little – he mentioned a head torch, so if you were out fishing oh, yeah. late. Yep. Things like that. And we've yeah. taken that, funnily enough, a bit more into the magazine. And we do six of the best. So, they're, oh, yeah. again, they're sponsored. So we just say six things. And I, I think I mentioned a rod. I mentioned whatever it was. Uh -huh. But I mentioned a coffee I bought in British Columbia called the Steelhead Brew or the Steelhead Blend. Um, and so that – and then people have added to that. And then we're, we're going to eventually encourage – and in the current one, actually, it's one of our contributors has written something. And the next one, somebody's chosen a cigar and, you know, some other – odd bits and pieces that are slightly more random and the the guy in the current one he makes up his his own granola bars so he mentions yeah. those so we're sort of taking it that way a little bit as well and we're going to encourage readers perhaps to enter their ones as well that's cool that's cool yeah i might have to steal that from you i like the the four pieces in my maybe i'll do a new segment uh, yeah. <laughs> i do like the i was doing some stuff there for a while just the gear because i love the gear i've always been kind of a gear head you know i'm loving uh 
you know, the, the, the different items. It's funny because I remember I was asking that for a while, kind of what's your go-to gear, you know, and it seemed like, you know, the dry bag, right? It was, it was, that was the common one or a camera, you know, there's these things, but no, it's interesting to hear. I think that's a good uh, little segment. Are, and are you doing gear reviews in the magazine and, or, or on, on the website? We do some on the website. Yeah. Um, the reason being is that, and one of the, the things that we try, because you can go down a difficult route if you did gear reviews, and so the, the, the problem with that is that I, I don't want to feel that you've got to say, and uh, yeah. you know, I wouldn't uh, diss a piece of gear anyway. No. And so there's so much, particularly with rods and lines, and you know, there's so much good stuff out there. But then it can go down because we want to be independent. We don't want to, we're saying, look, we're giving you this and we're independent. So I don't want to be able to do that. However, I will do that on the website. So, you know, I've reviewed the new Patagonia waders, which are excellent, I have to say. Um, so I've done those and we've got the Orvis two handers coming up that uh, one of my colleagues has done a review of, and we put those on there. So we're, it's really separate. And in effect, really the fly culture website aspects of it are where Eat Sleep Fish now lives really. And we yeah. used to do those reviews in on the online magazine so it's kind of the soul of it lives within the the website there but i think they're an interesting thing to do and they're fun you know i i like trying to add value rather than saying this is a nice rod i try and i shot one actually of the sage dart that's on the website somewhere and we filmed it so i talked oh, yeah. through what what's really important to me with the rod review is getting the line right and when I do a rod review, if it is, say, the Sage Dart or if it's another brand, whoever it may be, the first place I'll go is where if that company makes their own fly lines. And the reason I do that is that th there's a pretty good chance those uh, those rods, when they were being set up, were tried with their own brand fly lines. So, you know, that's a pretty good place to start. Mm -hmm. So we did this one and I took that through a little bit. But then we filmed it on the river and I fished. Oh, cool. And I just. A, a little three weight rod i caught a two and a half pound <laughs> sea run brown trout with it which was great you know it was absolutely fantastic but i tried to show everyone how it worked i was fishing a dry dropper how a three weight coped with three and a half mil of tungsten on it and things like that and try and add value in a different way rather than just saying right this is a great rod why is it a great rod you know so I try and add value to people to readers in a in a interesting or hopefully an interesting way anyway that's cool it sounds like and you guys it sounds like you're doing a little bit i mean you got the podcast and you got the blog and the magazine and, and even some videos it's interesting because you mentioned i think i think your podcast is hosted on buzzsprout right yes yeah buzzsprout i on on my other podcast uh, i interviewed the founder of buzzsprout kevin um and he I talked about what Buzzsprout was doing so well, and uh, he thought that was one of the things, you know, they were doing video for their content, right? They were doing video, they were doing a podcast, and then they had their blog. And he, for every topic they did, they covered it all, right? They did it one thing on all those different um, kind of forums or whatever. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. Is that your plan? I mean, what's your strategy to, to, grow, uh, to grow the magazine and everything you have going? I think, you know, it's an interesting point you make about that. They're a really fascinating company, Buzzsprout. Um, I think what we try and do is you've got to be in those marketplaces. You've got to be on Instagram. You've got to be on Facebook. You've got to be on Twitter, all of those sorts of places, letting know people you exist. And the interesting thing with social media, and I know we talked a little bit about it off mic, is that, um, you know, people, once they've liked and if they've been kind enough to like a picture, once they scroll down, they've probably forgotten um, what you put up there and stuff like that. So I, th I think it's really important to try and be in people's faces, but not too much. Yeah. Let them yeah. know you're there. And uh, by nature, it's not my well, it's not my nature to to be that way. But you have to be in all these arena and you have to be um, talking, to, uh, engaging with potential readership so i think you've got to be in all those sorts of arenas right now um and so growth wise we just want it to be and it was the same with the online one really you know we're the sort of i, I would love to think we're the sort of holding up a copy of fly culture and it was us that making the mona lisa smile like that and you know certainly from a point of view from the uk market that has you know, it, it's got an older generation of fly anglers, yet the, the younger ones are not being represented. So we're trying to bring the 
the 20s or the teens, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s into it. And some of the other magazines, I think they have readerships in the 60s and above. And I think part of that as well is part of where we had had the big still water boom, the reservoirs opening in the 70s and 80s. And that generation of anglers has got a little bit older. So I'm trying to find the people below that generation. They may not be fishing so much. We do get people of that generation buying the magazine as well, which is is great as well. But I'm trying to engage people in a different and hopefully an interesting way that they can sit down. And it's the sort of magazine, I hope, that they sit down and keep rather than it goes in a pile or just goes straight in the bin. And I get sent so many pictures of people sort of got a all the all of the previous issues we've put seven out so far uh, eight's about to come lined up on their bookcase and it's kind of it's really cool to have to interact with those people and that's what i'm trying to do that's my whole mantra and say look i'm just like you um and we just want to make it something that we enjoy putting out and we know our readers will enjoy as well and that that's the key thing in it you know when we hit those things the social media stuff then um, it's really ki- cool to see people saying they're they're enjoying what you're doing and and uh, enjoying the magazine and it, it's been really really nice to do that and I had I sent one out to Colorado uh, it arrived yesterday and the guy said you need to be selling it over here and it would be cool but I don't know how we could do that um, but we'll see you know I don't don't think we would um, but it would be interesting to to see how that what things like that would play out but you know really European but with a world you know, I think we're a big family of fly anglers, to be honest, and we're all singing the same tune. So, who is that target? I mean, when you think of you, you mentioned a little bit there, but do you have a like a target customer or a reader of your magazine that you think of when, when you you know you're writing that thing or editing? It, it's probably more somebody who wants the open space. They want to go to somewhere not everyone else is going to, which in this country is pretty hard to do. Right. Uh, and they want to go f- stand in a river. We're predominantly, not always, predominantly river moving water based. Mm-hmm. But we have, you know, we've got Golden Dorado. I think the next one. Your target isn't a a person in the in the UK necessarily. No, it's not. It's just for everyone. You know, we have chalk stream stuff in there. It, it's just for anyone who thinks, you know, they feel the same as I do about fly fishing and anything is interesting to read about and by people that they would kind of like to hang out with on the river as well or on the bonefish flat or wherever it was it could be could be anywhere and that's that's that you know we're not trying to take over the world um we just want to put something out that we think is kind of fun and interesting and um people enjoy that's that's the key thing all i want is our readers to enjoy it and that's it basically that's it perfect well let's uh i'm gonna start to wrap this thing up here and we we mentioned a little bit at the start a little bit about chalk streams and euro nymphing we've kind of been around uh around the area here but um if we take it back, I mean, uh, on chalk streams, are guys, is that just a, for the most part, dry fly, or are guys actually uh, nymphing now out there for that stuff? No, they can nymph. Generally, it will be, um, and a fair few of them, you've got to bear in mind, you can't wade in. So that can make your nymphing slightly trickier. Yeah. Um, so some of them you can't. Generally, your nymphing as a whole on chalk streams would tend to be wintertime for grayling um for them so it could be generally they i think some of them do allow dry dropper yeah. some of them not all of them or they may allow nymphs to be fish so traditional upstream nymph cast upstream perhaps to a sighted fish um and you know the greased up butter the leader and and watching that which is a real you know it can easily be a forgotten art form which is super skillful in itself and is great fun to do as well and so not so much of it on those sorts of river it tends to be more uh, the urine and thing but generally people like to see um the fish rising but obviously there's situations where that's not going to happen and and so nymphs are allowed and i know some will allow a dry, dry dropper but because in theory you're seeing the fish and because you're walking the bank you in theory if you take your time you can see the fish 
Um, so you can figure out. So it may be you plop a nymph in front of them and then induce it that way, you know. And so there may be ways of, of doing that. But now we're coming into the cream really of the dry fly fishing, not just in the chalk streams, but around the country around as the country. well. What, what is that you mentioned the grease line? What can you describe what that is? Uh, so what you do is float the end of your leader um, so that you could almost use that as an indicator. So, so you, you just put, put some, some dry mus- fly. Yeah, muesli. Yeah or whatever on the end and then you look for that take you know and that's one of the great advantages while we're talking about nymphing and we've been um skirting around uranymphing as well is that with uranymphing you're connecting with the fish immediately and that's the thing whereas those fish and i remember sitting on a chalk stream and i was standing on a bridge and a friend of mine was fishing upstream with a dry dropper and fish were eating the nymph and that wasn't registering and that was really interesting. The dry wasn't moving at all. And so with urine nymphing, you know, that t- or tight line nymphing, um, tight line nymphing, you are really um, in close contact. So the slightest little thing, you know, you're feeling the bottom, but you're also feeling that take of the fish as well. Um, so that's one of those other great big advantages of that method as well. Um, and w- where it's a, a, appropriate to use it, I guess, but it, it's a interesting way to do it. And I, I remember I took a group down to Montana and we were fishing, I think it was the Lamar hmm. and it hadn't really happened. You're a nymphing, you know, I guess people oh, yeah. like George and Lance yep. and those guys were, were probably doing it then because they were fishing competitions and, I was fishing that method and the guide was, you know, who I've got to know well and actually contributes to um, fly culture as well. Amazing photographer. Uh Um, I said he was watching me fish and just pull fish out of a pot. Uh We're fishing an indicator with a huge great copper jar on and stuff. And it worked. It was fine. And I said, what time do we finish? And he said, we'll be heading back about half five, whatever it was. And I said, why don't we hang around a little bit? And I showed him how to urinate then. Oh, cool. And I left some leaders and I said, I think you need to be using this. This will change your life. And we just we took it in turns. There were three of us fishing the pot with one rod. And I'd have a go, hook fish. My friend would, the guide would. And we just did. And it was just fascinating seeing somebody who had not seen it before. And it was it was great to see that. And it just was, you know, this was probably six, seven years ago. Um, so it was kind of relatively new in the US then, but it was kind of cool to show somebody this is a really interesting way of fishing. So it's, it, it, it is really cool. I think it has its place, as I said, and I'm always reminded by, uh, I think it's Lee Wolf's um, comment, fish deserve the sanctity of deeper water. And for me, you know, Tungsten beads are probably one of the best adventure inventions we've had in fly fishing, but it means fish can't go anywhere. You know, there's nowhere they can go to be safe. And I think that's really important to remember as well. We don't need to catch every single fish. And sometimes that's why I sort of use it, but I don't use it all the time because I would rather catch fewer fish, but know the rest of them are not sort of beaten up too much, particularly when we don't get big numbers of fish per mile as well. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, well, let's, uh, yeah, you know, the 222 is how I uh, try to wrap these things up. So can you give us, if we stay on the Euro, I think you mentioned a few, but a couple of your, your top two flies you'd be using. And, and if you were heading up to, let's just keep it on that chalk stream if we can. If you were heading up to a, a chalk stream and you were going to uh, fish a couple of Euro nymphs, what would you put on? Euro nymphs, if I was going to fish those, right now I'd be fishing a great big green drake pattern. Um, because the fish will be up in the water now the water temperature um, will be fine for them to start rising and stuff like that so it'd probably be throwing a dry yeah uh, and it will be um, it will be the big mayflies the green drakes Um, nymph wise uh, it's a tricky one Um, I would probably you know the variants probably of the pheasant tail that I talked about but I'd probably have a shrimp or caddis um, yeah pattern on there as well uh, probably a shrimp pattern there's a uh there's some really interesting epoxy i can't remember the company who does them now um, but there's some really interesting very thin uh shrimp patterns that sunk really quickly in the water and you could see them and they're really really cool to fish with and um again with that manipulation 
um, you can bring fish into play that way as well. But being able to see the fish eat the fly is deeply cool for me, I have to say. That is cool. That is cool. And then uh, so you, we talked about a couple of tips here. Any, any other uh, couple of Euro tips you would, you would add to, to that to maybe you know, help somebody maybe if we think of a little more advanced stuff? Yeah, I'd be thinking about the rod that I was choosing. I, I prefer, I would go, and it would be wonderful to have a rod that you could throw a dry on and a rod you could uranymph with. Mm. I don't know I found one just yet because I like the way uranymph Euro, rods fish. I like that really soft tip. And I know very often um, when I hook a good fish when it's on, I ain't going to lose it. You know, there's that um, suspension in the rod that allows me to play that. And I, sh I had a friend of mine, actually, a couple of winters ago. We were fishing for grayling with bugs. And I hooked two grills, um, one, uh, one sea winter um, salmon. And they were fresh. They were silver. They were about five pounds. And I could get them in without a problem. You know, it was a day mm -hmm. out of season. And I wasn't targeting them, but they happened to bite the nymphs. And I could get those fish in. So I'd really be thinking as well about um, the rod that I'm actually using. And that softer tip, without a shadow of a doubt, um, I would go look for the specialist rod personally. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there is a crossover that works. And I think the stiffer rods um just you're more likely to bump fish whereas it's phenomenal how you can play that and that's gone through into my normal sort of fishing that i'm looking for more mid-action rods because of playing fish as well and i can play fish better i don't bump them off and we've seen that trend anyway with rod manufacturers going away from those hyper fast stiff rods and that's kind of pleasing as well so mm -hmm. yeah i'd be thinking about that i would think about the oh a little tip if you've got a i use the rio um uranymph leader mm -hmm. which is milky white color and then it has a two-tone i think it's orange and pink indicator section then you add your um tippet to there a couple of things that have just come to me actually while we're talking about it think about where you're fishing the depth of the water. Don't be afraid to change flies. Don't be afraid to change weight of flies either. Yeah. Don't just stick with what worked last time. You're in faster water. You're in deeper water. Do you need to adjust your tippet length? Do you need to adjust the weight of your flies? Um, and play with that. Be flexible and don't be afraid to make more changes. I think that's a, a, a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to the indicator, those pink and orange ones are really, really cool. However, in some sunlight, it is hard to spot them, particularly winter time. So what I do is take a permanent marker, and with that, every sort of three inches or so, I'll make, take a black permanent marker and mark that up the indicator, and that gives me something extra as well in, in certain light conditions. Struggling to see that, that will make life so much easier. But flexibility with all fishing, really, is be, be flexible and don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to go, you know, change patterns. Don't be afraid to change weight. Don't be afraid to change size and keep those flies every now and again. I'll give it a dead drift down through the pool, keeping that line nice and tight. And then if nothing happens, I'll give it another go. If, I, if my gut says there's a fish there, I'll just bounce, boom, boom, little yep. movement just to see if that will bring someone into play. That doesn't happen. I think I've probably done an okay job. You should be catching bottom. I'm sure your podcasters have said that. You know, you should be getting right down into yeah. that, that um, into the bottom there. So, you know, if you're not doing that, think about that way. Don't go the easy option. Think about it, and that will find you more fish and allow you to fish the water more productively and effectively and efficiently as well. Sweet. So, and then what about on a couple of resources, if we stick on that Euro nymphing, or, I mean, I guess we could think of the chalk streams too, but would you have any other resources, books, magazines, uh, videos, anything you want to note? The big one or the main one is, uh, trout and salmon, um, which, um, that as the name suggests, covers all spheres of fishing from stillwater trout angling to river trout to salmon, to sea trout, all of those sorts of things. There's a great one called fly fishing, fly tying as well, mm -hmm. which is a little bit more, that sort of has, you know, fly patterns, that has um, how-tos, but it also has essays as well. And they're the main ones. I was just thinking, actually, a friend of mine that has a YouTube channel um, called Andy Buckley, and he has done a uranymphing masterclass on YouTube. I think you look up Andy oh, Buckley cool. Angry. 
and it's a really good one and it's full of um he's a good friend of mine and a really good guy and he's done a, a video on there that covers many spheres of it um and is really really interesting to see so i, I i'm told it i've seen it and people have told me as well that they they're really um are digging it that's awesome yeah and no, i'll put a i'll put a link to that uh, for sure in the show notes um and yeah, before we get out of here, any uh, anything else in the next uh, you know six months or so that uh, you have coming out new, you want to give a shout out to? Um, I'm trying to think. We're just going to keep enjoying it. You know, we we think there's light in the tunnel um, for the lockdown for yeah. us, um, and so we're trying really to get ourselves mentally prepared for being to get out. I've not been anywhere. I'm going slightly feral. I have to say at the moment that. You know, it will be cool. And I, I know we talked off mic about it. And it, for me, it's going to be fascinating to see how people um, approach their fishing. And I, I watched the the, um, the Patagonia film, The Complete Fisherman. Mm-hmm. And that ties in with where I've been going a little bit. That it, it, It's a film about an Italian guy who fishes in the mountains there um, with an old sort of wooden line with a horse hair, uh, wooden rod, sorry, and a horse hair line. And just fishes really simply. It's almost a form of Tenkara, really. But he's in his 80s. He's been fishing this river all of his life. And I wonder if we will go more simplistic, yeah. be it we carry less flies, be it the experience of being out there is enough. And I've noticed I've been getting all my bamboo rods out, casting those. And, mm. you know, with salmon and where I've been latterly steelhead fishing as well, I've I've had a glimpse backwards, really. And, and I fish when I, I've been um, still heading last couple of years and bar conditions when they haven't allowed british columbia was a bit cold but yeah. i fished in oregon last year i just fished um you know um old style patterns and lady caroline's march browns things like that and i'm going to carry that through i did a bit last year and i'm going to carry that through with my fishing carrying on i think i'm going to nod more to my bamboo rods and and enjoy the whole experience having had something that i love so much taken away for a short time and understandably and rightly so but it is kind of allowed me to reset a little bit and so right does this matter does that matter do i have to catch every fish can i sit down and smoke a cigar or whatever it is and spend you know i sit with my dog on the river and i've sort of planned out i'm hoping it may be monday we fish how i'm going to do it i'm going to fish like a maniac i'm going to fish terribly i'm going to cast terribly because i'm going to be so excited (laughs) but this time's allowed me to reassess what it means to me and and perhaps how i might approach things slightly differently yeah that's great yeah i'm trying to get out uh, with my girls uh uh, this weekend as well, I'm trying to get them out and do a little fishing. We're just, uh, we're, I think we're going to go for it. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it, man. Especially that just looking at uh, seeing them with a rod in their hands again. Yeah. You appreciate it. Um, but yeah, Pete, uh, flightculturemag.com is the best place where they can track you down. That's where you can find me. And, uh, I, it's usually me who will, um, answer to those emails okay. as well. And cool. by, if, if message me via facebook or instagram on there you can find me on there it's i always try and let people know it's me that they're speaking to we update all those things pretty regularly so i always try and put content out for people to enjoy even if they're not going to buy the magazine you know just a a resource for people to go hang out yeah that's great well you mentioned something at the start the uh, the eat sleep fish uh uh, blog I, i love that for me because i remember when i was in high school i had a bumper sticker that i loved and it and it said it said, eat, sleep, go fishing. And that was, yeah. uh, and I had that on for years, had that on the back of an old Honda, Honda Accord that I drove. So I love that. And then Rock Creek, right? You mentioned that too. That was my, my Montana. That's kind of my home. I consider that my home water there, you know, kind of. So there, if, if, you know, Missoula yep. for me is a really special place and the Blackfoot, the Bitterroot, the Rock Creek, the Clark Fork, yeah. Um, and round, you know, I did a tour with my daughter and we just did a road trip around Montana and, um, it was awesome. And I, I was reminded of it. Actually, I watched, I don't know if you've seen that amazing videos by Chase and Amy Barty and they did one. I know they've just done one in Labrador actually, mm-hmm. but, um, they travel in their VW camper van around Montana from Massachusetts. I think it is that to me sums up why I fish as oh, well. Cool. They've that. What was that called? 
I think it's called Trips in a Van, something like that. Oh, but it's, cool. it's Chase and Amy Barty, and it captures every. Again, it's not, you know, uh, it, it's everything about it, not yeah. just the fish, the bigger picture. And I buy into that massively, and and that was cool. And I sent it to my daughter the other day and said, "You need to come and have a look at this." She said, "God, I remember Beartooth Pass, uh, you know, um, fishing the Gallatin just outside the park, those sorts of places. It's just amazing the fishing you have there, and and Colorado. I've been lucky to fish a lot in as well, and it, it's just a wonderful place." to fish and so many people over here are influenced by the fishing that you have there the writers like john girak um the people like that even though we're not not everyone will head to places like colorado or or montana but they can read about them Mm -hmm. and it's amazing how they influence and you know his books changed my life and i know i'm not alone on that so the stuff you guys are doing over there does impact us and hopefully in some small way what we're doing here interests and and I think it does. I think it goes both ways. And I had uh, Klaus Klaus Freemore on was on. Well, I guess he's not necessarily for, right from your neck of the woods, but um, you know, he was talking about we were talking about underhand casting, right, and Scandi and all that stuff. And he, I mean, they've influenced a uh, big time, right, Loop and all that stuff. I mean, they've had a huge influence on the spay, the spay game over here. So I think it's uh, I think it does. And I would love to get. I haven't been over in your neck of the woods, but I would love to get out there and you know, and fish some of those chalk streams or, you know, whatever, right? I don't even care. I'd, I'd just love to get over there and travel. So hopefully I'll be meeting up with you someday soon. Dave, Dave I know all the wrong people, so I can get <laughs> Don't you worry about that. All right. All right. Thanks, Pete. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. All right. See ya. Cheers. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 143. Can you share this podcast episode with one other person? It would be amazing if you could find somebody uh, that you know that loves fly fishing and maybe hasn't heard of the show yet and just uh, send them a link, uh, email them, whatever works works out best. Thanks again for your support. If you have any questions uh, or a show topic, you can send me an email at dave at wetflyswing.com. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I am looking forward to catching up with you on the river or online soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.